Well, good morning on this April the 26th in the year 2020. Welcome you to the morning worship service here at Harmon Chapel Christian Church in Shady Valley. We are going live on uh, Facebook. Would encourage you to send out an invite uh, to family, neighbors, friends, co-workers. Also be aware that this service will be broadcast again this evening around 6.30 be available on YouTube at that time. If you've noticed today's date, it showed up on my calendar on my smartphone that this was to be the day that was to start our spring revival with Brother Frank Branson from Chilhawi. That has been postponed. It's been set to a later date. That'll be June the 28th through July the 1st, Sunday morning through Wednesday evening. And in about three more weeks, we'll get the publicity out, well into the sister congregations, and also that we can post at uh, various uh, businesses if they are open. Hopefully that this COVID-19 will be uh, suppressed and we'll be able to get back to a little bit of a normal way of life. Today, as we begin the worship service, I like for us to go to God's Word. If you have your Bible handy, let me encourage you to open it up to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at uh, verse 9 through 16. But before we read that scripture text this morning, I like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we pause at this time to thank you for another day of life, for this being Sunday, the first day of the week, that we can gather as the family of God, where two or three are gathered in Christ's name, we know that there he's in the presence. And that the Bible tells us that God is a spirit and that you're not bound to just one place at one time but by being a spirit that you are everywhere. And we do feel your presence today. We have felt the presence of the Holy Spirit this past week as we have walked in the paths of righteousness for Christ's name's sake. We're thankful for the social media, the platforms that you have given to us, the modern technology, that even though that we cannot meet collectively as a church, that we can still observe the Lord's Supper as a weekly appointment to have the opportunity to proclaim the gospel and for it to go forth and to reach probably more people than what it would even if we had just met here today. But Father, we pray for those that are on the front lines battling this dreaded disease of COVID-19. We also pray that you'd be with those that have contracted the disease and those that are their family members, and that you would just comfort them, that you would bring healing and restoration. And we pray for our government, we pray for our local government, our state government, as they're working hand in hand to bring back the opening up of our county, of our state, and of our nation. And I just pray that they look to you for wisdom and guidance. And as we were commanded in Scripture that we are to pray for our elected officials. And I pray that we have, that we are, and that we will. Again, we just ask that everything that is said and done in this service today, that it would lift up the name of Christ, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, and that in the end that we could say it was good to be together and to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in His name that I pray this prayer. And amen. Reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul, 
having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye might put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word this morning. Miss Rebecca is going to come and to join me now. And uh, we are going to sing a song together. This is our staple, our go-to song when we are asked to sing uh, for revivals or at a singspiration or maybe for special music. Uh, this is uh, an old one, uh, but a good one, and we hope that you enjoy it this morning. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall sing on that beautiful shore. The melodious songs of the blast, and our spirit shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful Father above. We will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and the blessings that hallow our days. In the sweet by and by time in our service now and we do this uh, every week as we see it followed by the early church and read in the scripture that they met and they met for the express purpose of the Lord's Supper that's the reason why that they came together this morning I would like to share a passage of scripture or actually a story that is very familiar to all of us it was the time that Jesus had come to the home of Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary. And you can read about that in Matthew chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And my imagination just kind of went with me a little bit on this, that I know that according to the scripture, that Lazarus and Jesus, that they were really good friends that Jesus was a frequent guest within their home, that he knew of Lazarus's two sisters, Martha and Mary. And I can just imagine Big Brother 
was coming in and announcing to his sisters that he had invited Jesus and his apostles to come and to share a meal. Now can you imagine of their excitement, of their joy? But as it began to progress and as Jesus made it to the house, he sat there in the living room, his apostles were gathered and Mary, the youngest sister, was sitting there at his feet. And Jesus was using this opportunity to teach his apostles and to interact with them. And she was hanging on his every word. But there was Martha, and she was in the kitchen all by herself. And she was worried about some things. Worried about the food, if the biscuits were going to rise and if they were not going to get burned. Worried about the lamb, if it was going to be juicy, if it was going to be dry. And also the other things that she had prepared for the meal. Because Jesus was sitting in the living room. It was God in the flesh, in her house. The one that she was going to serve this meal to. And she came out and she barked at her sister and told Jesus to tell her sister to come in and to help her. Because she was in the kitchen all by herself, getting everything ready to feed these many people. And Jesus didn't do that. He didn't tell Mary to go in to assist his sister. Instead, he said, Martha, you are worried, you are cumbered about many things. There's only one thing that is needful, and Mary has chosen that. You see, Martha had an aim to please Jesus. She really did. But yet she made a common yet dangerous mistake. As she began to work for him in preparing this meal, her work became more important than her Lord. What began as a way to serve Jesus slowly and subtly became a way to serve self. She has forgotten that the meal was in his honor, not Martha's. And it's easy to forget who the servant is and who is to be served. We come to this meal today and we know that we are the servants of Jesus Christ. It's not our meal. It's not anything that we have done to prepare this meal. We do prepare ourselves, yes, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, but also we know that our guest is Jesus, that he has bid us to come into his presence, that he has provided these emblems himself, that the unleavened bread represents the body that was broken there upon the cross of Calvary, that the grape juice of the blood of the vine as it has been squeezed it has been crushed that represents the blood that was shed for our salvation and in keeping in that memorial that we are to remember the great sacrifice for the high cost of our salvation for us to be redeemed to be bought back to be in the presence of God to be in unity with God again we see that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and he said for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this meal that you have provided for us through your son Jesus Christ. The great love that he had that created us in his image and in his likeness. 
but a love that was even more, that he came to pay our sin debt in full there upon the old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. We're thankful for these emblems and what they mean to us and the opportunity that we have to reflect and to show our appreciation, our devotion, and our commitment that this is an appointment that we cannot miss. This is an appointment that we should be looking forward to because it prepares us for the appointment of that day when you will say to him, go claim your bride. And Lord, if we have passed from this life, we will be the first to rise because the scripture says the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then those that are remaining, those that are alive will be caught up to be in the air to meet the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We long for that homecoming. We long for that home going. But until then, I pray, O oh God, that we keep our eyes focused upon Christ, that our hands are to the plow, that we plant, that we plow with straight furrows, that we come back and plant the seed of, of God, and also that we water the seed that has already been planted, and that we watch it grow in your time frame, and that you yield the harvest, but that we are the workers, that we are ready to go into the harvest field, because there's many souls that are out there today that are lost and unsaved that need Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you just lay that burden upon our hearts, that we would call them, that we would meet with them, that we would discuss with them your great plan of salvation. Again, Lord, we thank you for the Lord's Supper. We thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name, in whose name I pray this prayer. And amen. With your Bible still open there in 1 Peter chapter 2, I'd like for us to look back at two verses of Scripture that were a part of the Scripture reading this morning and talking this morning about living as God's people. That is the theme of living as God's people. And we have some directives, some commands, some blessings that have been bestowed upon us as Christians that we are to use every day of our life as we walk upon the face of the earth. Together now, let's look at verses 15 and 16 from the second chapter of First Peter. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. When a person is born of the water and of the Spirit, that person becomes a totally new creation. He or she has an altogether new spiritual nature. But that being said, when we look at our own personal life at that moment when we became a Christian, whether it was pre-teen in our teenage years or maybe as a young adult or maybe even as an older adult, all too often the gap between what we are and what we know that we should be, there's a great big distance between it. You see, the flesh does not give up without a struggle. The love of this world brings about the defection of some. Selfishness is a fatal blow to many others. An ugly division introduces contentions and strife. And in these and in many other ways, we see the forces of evil that they attempt to destroy our Christian character. And not only do they try to destroy our Christian character, but also they try to destroy our Christian witness. And nothing more would Satan want is for us to return back to our old sinful nature. Starting today, with the exception of Mother's Day 
and Father's Day, my sermons are designed to encourage fundamental Christian living. And if you have been an avid reader of the Bible, and some of you have spoken to me as I visited with you back in January and February, that you have read through the Bible numerous times. Some of you have just read through the New Testament, and some have read both Old and New. But as you read through the Bible, you can't help but to find the numerous figures that appear in the Word of God to set forth the relationship between Jesus and His redeemed. Matter of fact, the verses that are before our scripture reading this morning speaks about Jesus Christ being the living stone, the living stone. And that was the stone that the builders rejected. It's even prophesied that that would take place as recorded in Psalm 118, verse 22. And Peter was but restating a very well-known statement. It's one that we find recorded in John's Gospel, in John chapter 1, verse 11, where it says that Jesus came into His own, and His own received Him not. Appointed and approved of God, this living stone is now the chief cornerstone of God's great building, His kingdom among men that being the church of Jesus Christ. An offense and a stumbling block to some, but He is the precious stone upon which all that is solid is built. And from the figure of a building, Peter moves to the concept of Christians as the people of God in various beautiful relationships. And that's where I want to begin the sermon this morning. And I want us to look at one key thought here that is supported in three different ways within our text. I want us to consider citizens of God's kingdom. You see, when you were born of the water and of the Spirit, you had all your sins washed away. You received the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and as it says in Romans chapter 6, that you arose and that you walked in that newness of life. You were a new creature. You were a babe in Christ. All those sins had been forgiven, had been removed from you as far as the east is from the west. And you became a citizen in the kingdom of God. You became a member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we look upon our being a, of ourselves being a citizen within God's kingdom, Peter, first of all, talks about our naturalization and allegiance. Look, if you would, at verse 9 with me this morning. Peter said, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Now, during the Old Testament period, that being from Genesis all the way to Malachi that covers those 39 books that we have in our Bible that's listed under the Old Covenant, under the Old Testament, the chosen people of God, they were simply those that were born of Jewish parentage and also a few proselytes that had come in to join the nation of Israel. We know that Rahab was not born of a Jewish father or mother. She was a Gentile. She was a pagan. But yet she was allowed to come in to the commonwealth of Israel and to join them during the uh, when they came into the promised land as they came into Jericho first. She and all that were in her household that were in her house for safety. But under the new covenant that you and I are a part of today, citizenship comes all together as a matter of personal choice. It's the freedom of whosoever will. 
that will have come to the terms and conditions of God's plan of salvation that follows them, then they are a part of this new covenant that we have even kept part of that new covenant today as we remembered the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. We see here that Peter talks about that Christians are described as a royal priesthood. You have royal blood flowing through you this morning. And all Christians, yes, you are a priest. Now in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, only those that were from the tribe of Levi could become priest. And they interceded with God in behalf of those from the other tribes. But as a Christian, you are a priest and you have a direct line to the high priest, that being Jesus Christ. You don't have to go to someone and have that person to pray for you to get your prayers up to heaven or to ask for your forgiveness up to heaven. You can do that yourself as a Christian because you are a priest. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. That we can come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. The word holy means separate that you are set apart. And yes, Christians are separated. They are set apart from the non-Christian world and all of its impurities. And they are to follow a life in harmony with the example of Jesus and His teachings. And Peter presents a challenge here that we should live up to the honors that God has given us. Look again at verse 9 and to see those honors that we have that you are a chosen generation that you are a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar people why do we have all of these things given to us these are not just titles that mean empty words no they signify that we have been elevated to positions of highest esteem for a single purpose. What is that single purpose? Well, that we could show forth the praises of Him who hath called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. We no longer stumble through the darkness. We're walking in His marvelous light. And that is our naturalization and allegiance as being citizens of God's kingdom. But when we come to verse 10, we see God's marvelous mercy is demonstrated for us. Look at verse 10 with me. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now hath obtained mercy. There's three words that I want to focus in on here from this verse 10 in 2 Peter or second chapter of first Peter and that is not a people Peter again uses Old Testament terms to describe Christians there in the first century if you open your Bible back to Hosea in Hosea chapter 1 verses 6 through 9 we read of a very interesting narrative Hosea chapter 1 verses 6 through 9 and she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her Lorahamah, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God. And will not save them by bow nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, or by horsemen. Now when she had weaned Lorahama, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, Call his name Loamai, for they are not my people, and I will not be your God. I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. The last part of that came from chapter 2, verse 23. 
But here we see that Hosea is a prophet of God and he is teaching the people that God has rejected the nation of Israel. Let me tell you the reason why that God rejected the nation of Israel. It's simply that they were His chosen people. As I mentioned earlier in the sermon, they were married to God. They were the bride of God. But they had gone out and they had committed spiritual adultery. Instead of worshiping God in Him only, and God is a jealous God, that He said not to make any graven images, not to bow down and worship any other gods, they had forsaken those commandments. They had made graven images. They had bowed down to them and they had served other gods. They had played the role of the harlot. And therefore, God divorces the nation of Israel. He is no longer married to them because they have committed this spiritual adultery. They have played the role of the harlot. But here, Hosea foretold that the nation of Israel would once again return to God and He would have mercy upon them and they would be His people. Now, some people take this to say that this is going to happen in the future. That it hasn't happened yet that somehow the nation of Israel is going to rise up and be God's people in the future. I'm here to tell you that that has already taken place. Look, if you would, at verse 10. It says, "...which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, Peter says. Here in the first century, they are the people of God. It is the nation of Israel. Those Jews that have obeyed the terms and conditions of God's plan of salvation. We see that took place on Pentecost Sunday. That when the first gospel message was preached and when the first invitation was given, 3,000 Jews... 3,000 Israelites became Christians. They once again became married to God through Christ. They are the bride of Christ. They've taken on His name, the name Christian. Just the same as you and I did when we obeyed the gospel, was buried in white areas of baptism, and we came up out of that water. We were married to Christ. We are the bride of Christ, and we take on His name, the name Christian. Before I was baptized, I was Randall Johnson. But now I'm Christian Randall Johnson. I wear the name that honors Him. Peter in this verse applies these terms to the church. It's not some futuristic thing that's going to happen. But this is the new Israel. Those who are new Christians once were disobedient. They refused to be the people of God. Even Peter says here that had not obtained mercy... They had not sought out God's mercy before. But when they heard the gospel message, and when they accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life and repented of their sins and gave that public confession and were immersed into Christ, they became God's new people and received the abundant outpouring of His mercy and of His love. Well, we continue on with looking at our citizenship in God's kingdom. Peter says one more thing about it. And this is sometimes probably the hardest. Verse 11, we see that there is a spiritual war that's going on. Dear beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. What to Wear to the Battle was written by well, uh, Warren Wiersbe. And in the very first chapter, in the very first paragraph of that book, he simply states that life is not a playground, it is a battleground. Make no mistake about it today, Christian. The Christian life is a war. Within us, our unruly members war against our spiritual nature. Look, if you would, in Romans chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. He says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. There's a personal struggle going on every day inside of us of the spirit and the flesh. 
Which one is going to come out victorious? Which one is going to win? Well, that depends upon us. If we go to the Word and read and study the Word and we pray and that we ask for God's guidance, the Spirit will come in and greater is He that is in me than he that is in the Word. And we can defeat Satan. We can say, get behind me, Satan. And he will do that because the closer that we are to God and to His Word, the further we are from the devil. Well, the opposite is just as true. The further that we are from God and His Word and His teaching and His fellowship and in prayer, then the closer that we are to Satan. And that's the battle that we face every day of our life. It's not a playground. It's a battleground. Elsewhere we read that we war against the strong powers of Satan. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a battle that's going on that we don't even see or hear. Same thing when we look back in retrospect to what went on with Job. Now we have the hindsight. We're the Monday quarterback. We're able to see what's going on, the conversation that Satan has had with God and God has had with Satan and why these things have happened to Job. But Job doesn't have that perspective. He doesn't know. But yet that was going on in an unforeseen place where Job couldn't see God and Satan talking, couldn't hear the words that they were saying one to another. That's the same way that we go through life through these principalities and powers and rulers of the kingdom of this world, the power of darkness. Frequently, however, we do not act like strangers and pilgrims in this world. We should do as the song says, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I cannot feel at home in this world anymore. In fact, the Bible tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. Looking at the New American Standard Bible in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's coming a day soon that Jesus is going to return. He's not going to return to this earth to set up a kingdom, to set up on a throne for a thousand years. No, when He comes back, He's going to come back to claim His bride, to carry us across the threshold into glory. It's going to be a great judgment day. We have to be prepared to meet our God. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you are not a Christian, that you are not a part of the citizen of God's kingdom, that you have not obeyed the terms and conditions for salvation, that you have not accepted Jesus Christ by faith, or maybe that you have, but that's not enough. That you need to go from there and to repent of your sins. And you say, well, I believe in Jesus. I repented of my sins. Am I a Christian? No. You've got to make that public confession. You say, well, I did believe in Christ. I have repented of my sins. And I did make that confession publicly. I told my spouse. I told my parents. I went before the church and I confessed Jesus as my Lord. Am I a Christian? No. There's one more thing you need to do. You need to be immersed as according to the Scriptures. Not sprinkled. Not poured. The Greek word is baptizo. That you are buried in the water graves of baptism. Crucifying the old man and the old woman. And then you rise to walk in the newness of life that you've come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away all your sins, that you are now a Christian, that you are now a citizen in God's kingdom, not a kingdom off into the future, the kingdom now, the church, that you can be that royal priesthood, that you can pray to God and go boldly to the throne of grace. Well, if you do that, then you're truly a stranger. And if our sojourn here is just but a moment, we ought to act that way. We ought to talk that way and to let the world know where our loyalties are. That it doesn't lie in anything in this world, but it lies in Jesus Christ and according to the teachings that we find in His Word. We'll have Miss Rebecca to come now and to sing a song and then after which I'll do some announcements and we'll have our closing prayer.
would be dismissed. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He shares on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. Until then, may the Lord bless you always and end.